Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 101. Firstly, I want to say thank you to all those who sent super kind messages celebrating the 100th episode. I was thrilled to receive them and it really gives a boost to continue on for the next 100. (laughs) It has been a hugely busy time and an exciting time because it was the Wild Wonder Nature Journaling Conference, which was so much fun. There were 30 different teachers all giving classes on different aspects of nature journaling. If you missed the conference, there's still the opportunity to purchase a video pass, which means you have access to the recordings of all the classes and keynote talks. In fact, today's guest, Robin Lee Carlson, was a presenter at the conference, and hers is a not-to-be-missed class. When we recorded this interview, it was a few weeks before the conference, and I had hoped to get this episode out before the conference as well. So the timeline is a little funny, because we're talking about the conference in the future tense. But with the video pass, you can go back and watch Robin's class as a recording. I'll put a link to that in the show notes for you to follow if you'd like to do that. So I'm excited to share this interview with you because Robin has had a chat here on the podcast before, all about her work documenting changes after fire in her local area. And since then, she's published an amazing book about the ecological changes that she's watched unfold. We speak about the book, her natural history discoveries, the writing process, and a whole lot more. Let's listen. Robin, thank you so much for joining me again on the podcast today. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here again, Bethann. I am really excited to talk to you. Since we talked, you have published a book And first, I want to say a huge, huge, huge congratulations. Thank you. So the book is called The Cold Canyon Fire Journals, Green Shoots and Silver Linings in the Ashes. And it's an amazing book. You should be really, really proud of this achievement. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) So in reading the book, I realized, and we talked a little about this Uh, when we spoke last time on the podcast, but I realized just how important this particular place has been for you, not just in recent years, but throughout your whole life. I'd love to hear a little about that, about your connection with this place, the Cold Canyon. Yeah, it's interesting. It, I didn't necessarily think of it that way before doing the project. It was, um, it was a place I visited periodically as, as a kid and as a teenager, um, went on a school field trip there and hiked there with my family. Um, and, you know, in a lot of ways took it for granted. There are not a lot of, um, public hiking areas in, in that general area. And so it's a really popular spot. People really love it. Um, and I thought of it, you know, it, this is, this is a lovely place to go nearby. Um, and it didn't sort of, until I started doing this project and then thinking about what my relationship had been with it in the past, it sort of slowly dawned on me, it took until I was actually trying to write the book to completely dawn on me that this isn't the first time that this place has changed my perspectives on things. And so I realized that that foundation was set long ago with my ninth grade biology field trip there, where I learned about some, you know, some things that were were new to me. And so it has turned out that, that this is the sort of a place of transformation and that I had not had not appreciated that until I did this project and so sort of interesting how things can come all the way back around again yeah absolutely and I love that description of your biology field trip and how your teacher was looking at things like and things that you were wondering how can someone be interested in this and now here you are minutely studying this very same landscape the very same things she she planted the seed for. Yeah, it's funny. It, I mean, it, it, it really stuck. <laughs> it really <laughs> stuck with me. Her love of lichen stuck with me all of that time, even though I <laughs> didn't connect to it then. But, but it was somehow stood out to me that, huh, she thinks that's really, really interesting. And it doesn't 
seem all that interesting to me. I was super excited in hawks and whales and <laughs> more obviously charismatic things then. And, um, but then, that, I mean, it obviously struck some chord somewhere yes. that stuck with me in my mind for that long <laughs> and for me to yes. really realize that, well, finally I'm coming away <laughs> for all that time. I had, you know, long been interested in, in much less showy, obvious things. I was studying spiders and millipedes and millipede sperm in graduate school and all sorts of sort of <laughs> more esoteric <laughs> things, but had not come back around to lichen until I was actually doing this project. And so again, it was a really satisfying full circle. Yeah, absolutely. So people can go back and listen to our conversation about how this project started. And I'll put a link for that in the show notes for this episode. But I wonder if you could give a little recap about how you started nature journaling and documenting this area with real purpose. Yeah, so I um, was working on transitioning to doing uh, natural science illustration as a full-time career. Um, I was sort of slowly transitioning out of working on um, sort of data and reporting projects to do with salmon in California and had started doing some illustration work. But what I really wanted to do was to um, find a way to demonstrate what I was really excited about, which was using field sketching as sort of a primary communication tool. So not as the background research for final illustrations or anything like that, but but as a way of, of more... Um, in a sort of more lively manner, bringing people into that experience of being out there wherever I was um, and learning about whatever it was that I was learning about and wanted to share. And so I started thinking about that probably a year or two before I found this project and thinking about what I really wanted to do was document ecological change um, and had been, you know, thinking about potential subjects to do that with and, and hadn't settled on anything in particular and had done little things here and there. Um, but then when this reserve that was so close to home and so convenient and open to the public, and I knew it wouldn't be messed with after the fire because it's a natural reserve. Um, when that happened, it didn't occur to me right away. It took me a little while for it to slowly dawn on me that here was exactly what I'd been looking for this whole time. This would be, um, you know, I'd be able to document fairly rapid change. So I'd get, you know, I'd get some, a sort of a good momentum going from the beginning. And it was somewhere that I could just count on going back to again and again and again. Yeah. And so you've built up this relationship. And so it started, it started with a fire that came through and then you realize this is something that I can actually watch as it, as it transforms. And the, and the story of that is so beautifully documented in the book. I'd love to talk about the view that you had and so many of us have that f of fire as disaster and and how your view of that has evolved through this process of spending time recording writing about painting the aftermath of this disturbance your relationship with fire and your view of, of it and how that's evolved yeah so it i mean it it it's interesting being very much on the other side of it now. It's interesting how slow a process it was when mm, mm, you had, mm. <laughs> had a big shift in perspective. It seemed so obvious. And so it, it, I sort of am surprised every time I think about how gradual it actually was to mm. figure all of this out and how, um, so the, the, the project absolutely originally was just a, a sort of a field sketching and, and visual documentation project. I was not, I mean, Sure, I thought, oh, wouldn't this be fun if I turned it into a book or something like that? Mm -hmm. But that was not the goal, and 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 I was not doing anything along those lines in the beginning. Um, and so it really took the actual book writing process to, I think, sort of finalize some of the some of the realizations I had. But so definitely, when I started the project, my first reaction in hearing that this place that I'd hiked since I was a kid had burned was, "Oh my goodness, that's terrible. That's you know, yes. it's gone. <laughs> um, of course, it'll come back. I mean, of course, I know things come back after fire. That happens all the time in California. But the immediate thought is, but it's gone right now, and it's mm. gone mm -hmm. for a while. Um, and so I definitely went into it with this sort of thought that that's great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna document the recovery of this place. Um, I mean, so much of what I did with um, salmon and stream restoration was thinking about 
you know, recovery, taking things back to a uh, more, um, a healthier state. And so since we use that word a lot, regrowth and recovery with fire, it feels very much like we are returning to a healthier state. And so that was, that was the mindset I went into it with. Um, and so absolutely when I started out, I, you know, had some basic ideas of, of, you know, cycles of, of, of regrowth after fire, but I, I definitely did not know that much about fire ecology. And so I, I tried to go into it with my eyes wide open to see whatever it was that I could see and just, um, follow whatever threads of, of whatever I found interesting as it, as it developed. Um, and so it, I mean, absolutely at first it was, great to see um shrubs re-sprouting right away see all of the wildflowers as they showed up and um and all of that was stuff i had sort of expected to see so it's not like that was any mind-blowing change mm -mm. and so i would say for the first number of years that i was doing it it you know it, i probably mostly felt like i was documenting recovery um but as i started to think of things more holistically and as i came back year after year it it really became clear that that it's not like anything actually needed to recover because the fire itself didn't destroy anything um individual lives were lost um but so many things so many things in the canyon um either found the time right after the fire to be their ideal opportunity in the world um way better for them than a full lush green mature ecosystem so that's what they've been waiting for that's what they consider the mature ecosystem is the burned yes the burned um habitats um or other things that sort of just continue on along <laughs> as normal and it's not like fire was even that a, a big deal i mean a windstorm fire you know these things happen a super cold snap just just part of the normal cycle and so what um what that what they took until probably the second time that the canyon burned so it burned in 2015 and then it burned again in 2020 um which again took me right back to oh my goodness but everything i was yes. to recover is gone <laughs> And I had yes. this interesting flip-flop of, okay, I've learned that it's not a tragedy, but this still kind of feels like a tragedy. And so yes. it really took, I think, sort of going around in circles, processing what that meant to see it burn again after I'd been so deeply involved in it to, to really come around to understanding that this is, this is, this is part of the daily life of the canyon. Um, even if there are, you know, things related to climate change that are changing how often it happens it's still fire is still no matter what it's a natural part of this ecosystem yeah that's a powerful realization and i and i loved the way you described yeah the words we use the current language of recovery regrowth restoration rehabilitation all this implying that we're rebuilding to some climax state whereas your realization that this is a cycle and nature is full of cycles and that I, I found the language around that really powerful and that that understanding yeah for some for some species this is this is their windfall this is their this is their moment <laughs> exactly <laughs> and there's there's one important animal symbol throughout the book and that's the newt and I'd love for you to talk about the newt and oh, it has, I, I didn't know the story, the life history and this incredible fire retarding strategy that it has. I would love for you to talk about the newt and its importance in this book. Yeah, I, um, that's something I just loved about the process of writing the book was these stories that just emerged. I don't. I don't think of myself as a storyteller in any way because I'm terrible at imagining brand new things. I'm terrible at you know coming up with characters and plots and things like that. So I don't think of myself as that kind of a storyteller. But what I have loved has been sort of unearthing and, and finding and letting the stories come to me that I then get yeah. to tell in the book. That's been incredibly satisfying. I think I always wished I were a storyteller. Um, and so I just I loved the ones that came to me. So California newts are. Um, they they sort of have an interesting backwards hibernation cycle from the way that a lot of people think about hibernation. They um, are born in the in the spring um, in the water. The eggs are laid in the water, and then they um, become 
land dwellers and they go up the hills as as juveniles first um, and they find um, burrows. They don't make their own, but they find various cavities underground to spend the long, hot, dry summer um, in California. And then um, in the winter, they make their way back down the hills to the water. Their bodies change into a more um, aquatic form again, and they mate and they lay eggs and they live, they can live for maybe 15 years. So they repeat that cycle every year, um, returning to mate, but then finding, uh, fi spending the summer, uh, safely underground. So what that means is they are often safely underground during fires. And so yes. in Canyon, um, probably they have done fine in the fires because they're underground in the time of the year that the fire is happening anyway. Um, but I found when I was just, you know, poking around in scientific papers, looking for interesting information about species on fire, I found this tiny little footnote in a journal, um, noting that a former manager of a different UC natural reserve who had been doing some controlled burning on that reserve, um, had happened to be watching. Um, it was a very low intensity, small flame with a very um, mellow fire, but he watched two California newts walk straight into the advancing flames, straight through the flames. And as soon as they entered it, the heat of the flames caused something in their skin secretions to foam up, like someone had just sp sprayed them with fire retardant and presumably helped um, insulate them from the heat. And of course, I'm sure it only lasts for a certain amount of time. They couldn't walk through yes. some huge fire area with that, but it meant that they chose to walk into these flames and out the other side. And so he picked one of them up and the foam stuff sort of brushed off. He said the newt was totally unharmed. So he set That's it down wild. on its way. <laughs> and it's, I hadn't, I, I haven't found, he hasn't found anyone else referencing having observed that. So I, I don't know. It sounds like that's probably a, a common adaptation. But so for the for the fires that happen at times when newts are not hibernating or, or something like that, they obviously have this other way too of just just moving through it. And so yeah. what that also makes me think is what other adaptations to fire are out there that we have no idea about still? Yeah, yes. When I was reading the book, I was thinking there are so many stories. I mean, you've sat with this landscape for a, a lot of years with a lot of attention and you've learned these beautiful things about this landscape and and so did the scientists that you were just talking about, but there are so there is so much going on. Yeah. All these stories going on all the time in all the landscapes that we don't necessarily know about and that's quite astonishing, isn't it? Yeah. It's I think that's sort of the most beautiful thing about the world is is the way we get yeah. glimpses into all the things that we don't know and aren't ever gonna yeah know. yeah absolutely oh <laughs> so chapter three of the book is called emerald and sepia new leaves on burn slopes and chapter four is called an explosion of color wildflowers seize the day and i would be so interested to hear about the role color plays in your relationship with this landscape and also your understanding of the changes that have happened since you've been observing Cold Canyon. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's so interesting that the recently burned landscapes and then also for a while afterwards are, it is just very much the sort of the color <laughs> that, mm. that, that sort of jumps out at me as the, the yeah. I, I guess the, the sort of defining characteristic of some of these stages. So yeah. had thanks to the second fire happening, once I already had this relationship with this place, and also once I had the relationship with the reserve managers too, so that I could go and visit um, right after the fire when I had not that relationship with them before, and they closed it after the fires to make sure it was mm -hmm. safe before the public went in again. And so it was really striking after that second fire, first being there and everything having sort of been evened out to this brownish tone and there were mm. variations in it sort of, you know, orangey brown and greenish brown, but, but it was brown. And that, that was really striking. It had this very muted feeling and things were very quiet then too. So it was this sort of interesting feeling of, you know, maybe being wrapped up in gauze or something as I went mm. through it both for the, for the colors and for the sounds. Um, but then it doesn't take long at all for that to start to change. And so you have this kind of muted um, evening out of everything, but because the um, 
shrubs, especially in, in the chaparral habitat, start to re-sprout re so quickly. Even if this is the middle of the summer here where things are very, very dry, there's no water in, in, in evidence, um, they have stored up water in their roots. There's also water. It helps you see sort of that there's water underground that you really don't know mm. there even when it's so dry. And so that green starts appearing so fast and it's it's both the shrubs respreading and then also um a plant we have called soap plant that that resprouts also immediately it's got it's got a bulb underground that has enough reserves that it also sends up new leaves right away it loves fire um and so that first green on the on the you know either still ashy hillside so it's a kind of a dark brown either because it's bare dirt or because there's still some ash around and so i found that the sort of the incredibly striking next step um, and then of course, once you hit spring, there's the colors of wildflowers everywhere. And so that Amazing. it really, there's definitely a, just a completely color story, nothing else, just the color yes. are changing in that, those first months to a year after the fire. You must know your watercolor palette so well in, in tune with the landscape. You know, this is, these are the colors that I mix to, to capture that charred stump or whatever it is yeah <laughs> yeah definitely lots of blue and brown <laughs> and rough and ochre <laughs> yeah yeah that's so cool so you alluded to it but I'd love to talk more about it the book that you wrote is different from the book that you first envisioned and I'd love to talk about that how the writing process changed what came out of you in the end? Yeah. So, so when I started the project, um, I mean, like I said before, I really, my m main goal, and I thought probably it was going to be the only product was the sketchbook pages that I would use on a blog or, you know, maybe in workshops and things like that to communicate what I was learning. Um, but when I did give some thought to, okay, so if I turned this into a book, what would that book look like? It was a, it was a much more, um, sort of um, straightforwardly educational book that I was that I was picturing not academic um, definitely aimed at a, a popular audience but much more here are the principles of fire ecology and here how they yes. are you know illustrated by what I did um, and you know that I would use sketchbook pages that, that yeah, I'd be making diagrams and and sort of more textbooky maybe seeming stuff um, because my background is academic and so that was what I um, just sort of what I naturally thought that I would be doing um, but then um, and also because I don't have any particular confidence in writing in a more personal manner or storytelling, like I said before. Um, mm -hmm. But when um, John Muir Laws introduced me to Heyday and when I started talking to the publisher about what the book might be, it went through it went through several iterations in my discussion mm -hmm. with them. But um, what they were really encouraging was... Um, was to turn this much more into a narrative and to bring in the mm -hmm. personal aspects, but most importantly, to, to focus on the storytelling. Um, and uh, I got some really great advice up uh, at the beginning um, as I was working on, I sent in a, an earlier draft um, and got feedback on that and got some really good advice about storytelling on different levels of, you know, mm -hmm. about storytelling on the, the level of an individual organism and what's happening with it, storytelling on the level of my own personal experience, storytelling on the larger scientific story and the larger story of what's happening in the ecosystem. And that really clicked. And so that, that guidance really allowed me to sort of let go and, <laughs> and write what the book actually turned into and it, and, and yes. having sort of the, um, the faith that the publisher had that I would be able to, to meet that challenge was, was really critical <laughs> in me feeling like I could do it. So. Yeah, that's amazing. But the, you tell a beautiful story and I can hear you saying, I'm, I'm not a natural storyteller, but what comes through in the book is this beautifully crafted narrative and, uh, story that is super engaging. And I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering how you revisited because you tell in great detail of what you saw, what you felt in the past. And I'm wondering if you drew on your old 
journals? Did you just imagine? How, how did you bring up the richness of the, that story from the past? Yeah, so it having been a visual project the whole time made a huge difference because I had done all of this field sketching and because I had those notebooks to go back through, um, I had that much more direct and visceral connection to having been there because of drawing, because of being more present in the moment, because I was doing the drawing and because I had that record where I can remember what it felt like to do that drawing. And that takes me back then to the other places um, that were engaged at the same time. So that was important. Um, And the photo record that I had to, because I, um, for several different reasons, I've been taking tons of photos the whole time. Yes. The first one being I can't draw everything that I want to draw while I'm out in the field because there's not time. So I'm taking things <laughs> simply so that I can keep drawing more things when I get home. Um, and then I want drawings of, the, I mean, photos of the things that I am drawing um, in case I have questions about it later, just going back and checking things. I can't tell you how many times I've gone back to check something that I drew and mm-hmm. something else in that photo that I didn't draw. That yeah, was wow. Interesting and important too. And so having those, it, I've, gone back through the photos so many times because, you know, generally the photos are sort of a record of as I go down the trail, I've got a sequence of photos of a lot of the things that I saw. And so I can really recreate any particular visit through the drawings and the photos. And so that made made an enormous difference. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. So you write that you wanted to exist on two levels at once by being fully present to what you observe with the senses in that moment when you're when you're there and also to extend your imagination around you in space and time to ask questions about the story of this place and I'd love for you to describe how that was these two things at the same time two ways of thinking and looking yeah so that was something that also sort of slowly developed over time um, in thinking about how how important it is to be aware of everything that is unseen um, that's going on at the same time that we're there. And the first thing that made me start thinking about that was when I started really thinking about these respreading shrubs and all of the lessons that they have that I didn't necessarily fully think through in the beginning. But so they're respreading right away and that's because they've stored all these resources in their roots, in burls and other root systems. And so thinking more deeply about what that means is that the entire top of the plant can burn. It can be completely Mm. gone. Um, Well, that was the part of the plant that seemed like the most important part of the plant to me. (laughs) I think to most of us, because it's all we ever see. We don't see the roots underground and we know they're there, but they don't seem like like the most important part of the plant. But then to start to realize from the plant's perspective, <laughs> they're what matters. Obviously, everything above ground, at least for plants that have evolved in in, in landscapes with fire, the top is important. They, they need it eventually, but they can let it go. They can let it mm-hmm. go like we cut our hair. <laughs> um, and everything they need is underground. And so starting to think about, well, yeah, so <laughs> everything I see is great, but I it's so important to always be aware of the fact that the most important parts of the, the habitat and the ecosystem are not necessarily something that I'm experiencing directly when I'm mm. there. And I want to try to be much more consciously aware of, of all of the pieces of this that I don't get to experience myself, that I'm not necessarily drawing as I go through, but to still be thinking about as I walk, all of these things that are happening under my feet. Um, And another excellent example of that was after the second fire, um, I was talking to the reserve manager and he was talking about, you know, being there the weekend after the fire and um, being at a, so the stream that runs through the Canyon is a seasonal stream. And so a lot of it is underground and and completely dry above ground um, in the summer. Um, But there are some pools that usually have water in them through the summer, but not a whole lot. But right after the fire, those pools were, full. And it really drove home for him how much once all the plants that are sucking up water on the hillside have been burned and are suddenly not sucking up all that water for a while. All of that water is, is moving through the system and reaching the bottom of the canyon again. And I mean, I don't think about that water being there, that water flowing. (laughs) Not at all. Not in the summer. It feels like there's no water at all in the summer. And so it's really important to to sort of let this burned landscape show us all of these things that we don't usually think about at all. 
That's an incredible example that I never thought of, that the plants aren't holding the water, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to then be flowing through the system. Yeah. Wow. And this, this is amazing. It's really eye-opening to just to sit and listen and, and to hear the story as told by the landscape. Yeah. That's quite yeah. astonishing. Wow. You write a lot about how you exist in this landscape with the mind open and also the heart open. And you know that I'm a heart person and I'd love for you to tell me more about the heart piece of this puzzle for you because you are a scientist, but you speak and it comes through in the book that this is a lot about heart as well. Yeah. So a lot of that, a lot of the way that I think about sort of mind and heart has to do with um, how important that, it, and this has always been a very conscious way that I think about science um, in general, which is, yes, absolutely. It's important for science that we attempt, you know, to be as objective about things as possible and to look at something with an outsider's perspective and have distance from things. But it's also critical that we always understand that we are never completely attaining that and that we always know that we are we are part of our observations we will never not be part of our observations and we have to understand and put ourselves into that so that we know <laughs> where we're coming from when we make those observations and that's always been i mean that that has just always been one of the most important things i think people need to have in mind in, with yeah. science and so i have really really relished the opportunity with this project and with this book to sort of more more fully explore and make explicit how important that connection is. And so, um, I mean, I think in a way it's helpful to think of that as sort of the mind is our attempt to be objective and to understand mm -hmm. what's going on around us by understanding that not everything is about us and that there's, you know, a lot of important things that we can gain from this more distanced approach, but that we'll never achieve that and that our heart is always a part of all of all of the observations we're making and so understanding that i am in this landscape and understanding that i am bringing my entire history to what i see in this landscape is yes. is the most important thing i think about about science understanding science doing science and so um I definitely don't think that there is any actual separation between mind and heart yes. and science. It's much more a matter of us understanding that those are always both there. Yes. Yeah, so when you were speaking, I was thinking of Jane Goodall because when she started her research, she was criticized for putting herself in there too much, being too involved, not being objective enough. And then as time went on, it, it was, un it became understood that, her observations were so important and her being her being herself in that context was important as well mm. yeah interesting there's a quote from you and I love this it is being in a landscape and seeing the way it changes changes a person can you tell me about how this project has changed you as a person yeah so the this this sort of slow and gradual shift in perspective in how I see what happens after fire and how fire fits into a landscape, um, I think is an indication of, you know, all of the things that are possible when you attempt to spend a lot of time and a lot of close attention and observation with a place. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be a place, but that's definitely what I'm focused on. And so, mm -hmm. Um, it's that kind of change that is so um, important to me as having come out of this project in this particular shift in perspective. But then mm. what I want to convey is the all of us have that ability um, to experience that kind of a shift just by paying close attention to a particular place. And it, it will, <laughs> it's guaranteed to, in unexpected ways, change us and how we experience the world and how we interpret yes. the rest of the world based on what we have been able to see happen by looking closely in that one place. There's another quote. I hope you don't mind me quoting you. I've got a no, few no, really no. beautiful ones. <laughs> but um, I love drawing metaphors from nature and like learning about my own life through nature. And this quote is so lovely. I'm going to read it now. 
close attention to Cold Canyon's hillsides and growing knowledge about how life has adapted to those habitats, and especially to fire, have shown me that the role models I value most are the chaparral shrubs. Theirs is the best recipe for life in difficult environments. Hold on tight, grow deep roots, and always share with your neighbours. Lessons from nature are so wonderful, and I love that you've re- you're reflecting on this and watching nature for for these lessons about life. <laughs> yeah, and I like. Um, I mean, I really enjoyed this feeling of um, the closeness and intimacy that I developed with the shrub. Yeah. Um, because I, I, I often I think we overlook shrubs because. I, Mm. for some in some cases it's because because of um repeated fires forests that you know places that used to be forests are turning more to to shrub lands and so there is a you know an understandable reaction of you know not wanting the shrubs to take over what was your Mm. beloved forest um but being able to understand that those shrub habitats are also critically important in their own right. Of course, we don't want to lose all the forest to, sh- to shrubs, but we also don't want to lose all the shrubs to grasslands. Um, yes. That there's so rich and important habitat in habitats in the shrublands and so many species that rely on them and that the shrubs themselves are beautiful and have these amazing adaptations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'd love for you to hear, like you were talking about sharing with your neighbours, but I'd love, I'd love to hear about the story of the community that you have found in this project. Because as you start a project, you don't know what's going to come out of it. But for you, you've had interactions with scientists, ecologists, field researchers, Indigenous people who, who know this land so well. I'd love to hear about the community that's that's developed around this for you yeah that was um i mean in some ways that was a hope i had from the beginning because this is a university of california reserve there's active research being done there and it's such a cool reserve because the public gets into this and a lot of the reserves are closed to the public so the the research can you know can can proceed un, uninterrupted but because i knew there were researchers there actively i i did have <laughs> from the beginning the thought that well this is a great place where i will be able to to interact with people that are that are studying this habitat and can give me some more perspectives about fire um but i definitely did not <laughs> expect that those interactions would be expanded so far beyond cold canyon mm. as well um and so um, one of the key parts of that was meeting um, Miriam Morrill, who mm-hmm. was um, a participant in a in a nature journaling hike that I did at Cold Canyon um, fairly early on, um, and it was great because we connected because she was she was paying close attention to a burned landscape, and she and I started to talk, and she was telling me about the things that she could still see. So it was I'm trying to remember I think it was two and a half years. No, I'm not sure. I don't remember how many years since the fire, but a while. Mm-hmm. Um, that, um, I wouldn't necessarily know to look for these things on the landscape, but she was looking at at patterns of where trees were dead and and other things and making some conclusions about which way the fire had moved, what the fire had done in the canyon and was telling me about it. And I was saying, oh yeah, that that is how the fire behavior was described to me in the beginning um, by, by the reserve um, staff um, long ago. And so we connected because of that. And then when she put together a group of nature journalers that went and participated in a um, prescribed fire training exchange hosted by the Nature Conservancy and um, a bunch of state and federal agencies and the Karuk tribe in the Klamath um, in California, that expanded (laughs) my horizons exponentially by being able to see fire out in the landscape in a different scenario than in Cold Canyon. But of course, since I didn't see Cold Canyon burn, not the first time or the second time, um, getting a, being able to actually watch fire um, and to experience that with other nature journalers, you know, and all of us sharing our different ways of paying attention and observing that um, led to being able to observe fire closer to home at another prescribed burn. Um, and so that aspect of being able to, to experience fire in a way that I never would have been able to otherwise was just amazing and just made through sort of fortuitous <laughs> interactions. Um, and then I also ended up, once I did have stories that were emerging from what I'd seen myself in Cold Canyon, um, that I wanted to be able to tell 
more fully than than I had myself experienced. I started re reaching out to other scientists, like um, the lichen biologists that I went out to a different reserve with, um, and was able to, you know, discuss their experiences, discuss their research, and use that to sort of complete some of the aspects of the story that that I was lacking with my own observation. So it was great to be able to fill in some of those gaps. Yeah, I love that. That each person has their own focus. Each person has like you say, brings their whole history and their interests and Miriam's very focused on fire. Other people like your um, teacher are focused on lichen and everyone has, everyone has a little piece of the story to tell and when we share those stories with each other, it, it builds up a richer picture. Yes, very much so. <laughs> I love that you've been able to experience that and, and be out there with other people who are as enthusiastic about this as you are. Yeah, very much so. There's another beautiful quote which I'd like to read from you uh, from the book. It, it is, I've been a closer witness to these dramatic changes than I ever expected and I constantly wonder what we're losing and what we've already lost. I've stood in absolute stillness and quiet after fire and it's opposite too, the dance and cacophony of birds overhead and insects nearby, the green shoots rising and the pollen falling. Contemplating these changes to the climate set in motion long ago and accelerating to this day, I think of destruction and ruin and time, while all around me there's still hearts beating, lungs breathing, buds swelling and life continuing. I find this incredibly powerful and I'm really interested to hear about this dichotomy that you've experienced firsthand of loss and hope and destruction and potential. Can you talk about holding those two things at the same time? Yeah, it's 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 such a I mean it, it's such a continuing <laughs> um question that of course is is not resolvable um but I I really love the way that this project has given me the opportunity to sort of fully explore all of the all of the different aspects of that of hope versus mm. despair um mm. since so i now i don't remember what i said exactly at the beginning but so the 2015 fire was 30 years after the previous fire in the canyon which is at the it's sort of the bare minimum of what's a healthy interval between fires for chaparral it of course, com completely depends what habitat you're in, what that fire regime historically looked like. Um, but it was very interesting because I was, of course, interested in fire and 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 ecological change in the larger, you know, uh, story of climate change from the beginning. But what I was looking at for the first five years was really fire after a healthy interval, fire that really, you know, sure. there was not probably anything detrimental <laughs> about that fire in that place at that time. And so, um, so I got to experience this incredibly hopeful thing that even in the larger context, of course, California, you know, the fi fires are all sorts of different things, um, many of them still quite healthy, and that's really important for us to keep that in mind. Um, but still, it was it was you know very much a, a the opportunity to understand what fire means in a very healthy and hopeful context in the beginning, and then when it burned again, it was a really important chance to interpret that and be challenged, mm. understanding and realizing that fire is still a healthy thing, even if I know that five years is really short and five years mm. not enough time for the plants to do everything they need to do. Um, to be able to continue potentially if fires keep happening at that interval. But but it's still really important that even after five years, fire is still doing a lot of healthy and important things in the landscape. And I, that's not necessarily something that I even now fully understand mm -hmm. and can, you know, <laughs> knowing all of these things is a whole lot different than truly feeling them. Um, and I've been, I've been reading... I mean, I, I've been reading some very interesting things about, you know, even when fire seems like a catastrophe because it burns over this huge period and a uh, huge area and it kills absolutely everything in that area. It's still a lot of that is really, really helpful. And there's certainly controversy about exactly what each kind of fire means. But um, really understanding just how healthy fire is, is, is a big challenge. Um, 
But that still also has to be balanced with the fact that there's so much that's hopeful about fire and burning. But of course, there's so much <laughs> that is changing now and has changed already. And it's, you know, and, and, and we're already on the other side of that change. And so one thing that I've been struggling with this summer for sure has been, it's so dry. California is in, in such a drought and last summer was very dry and this summer is even drier and it, the canyon doesn't look like it has. <laughs> this summer, it's very different than any of the other summers it, that it's been like since this started. And that's not because of the fire. I mean, the fire absolutely probably has, absolutely probably, that's a good one, um, <laughs> made changes in the habitat. It will have changed because of that five-year interval. But what I'm seeing this summer is not because of the fire. It is because of mm -hmm. drought and heat, for sure. But there are flowers that I usually see in July and August that that I just, at least where I was hiking, I wasn't seeing and things are just so dry that, um, I mean, that I think it's really important to, to balance the hopeful aspects of the fire with the things that don't feel hopeful at all right now. Mm -mm -mm. But then again, to remind myself that even with drought, drought also is a natural cycle and that causes things to shift and nothing is ending. Um, nature goes on, nature is always changing and just what keeps me sort of going and keeps me um, engaged and, and always interested is things are always changing and I wanna be part of that. I want to be there, I want to be witnessing it and I wanna know what's happening and that's, that's the most important thing to me. Um, and, and just knowing that that's always going to be this balance of grief and of, and of hope and joy. Yeah. That's such a life lesson, isn't it? Because we can, as humans experience two opposing things at the same time. And that can feel like hard to, to balance these two things. And yet life gives us repeated situations where we have a chance to practice this, <laughs> holding these two things. I love the way you present, you present the opportunity for people to, to think and rethink about these things and to, uh, to change our relationship with fire because we have, we have, conditioning that tells us fire is a disaster fire should be excluded and and it's interesting uh that came out of our conversation last time that the history of your place and my place here in australia the history of um indigenous fire management fire exclusion all this stuff um is very very similar um and so we we have our own conditioning about what fire means um, and you, your book and your story and what you're doing invites people to think deeply about that and question some of the conditioning that we have. And I know that uh, some people have been giving feedback that you've helped them heal their relationship to fire and that's, that's a powerful thing and I hope that you feel that, that, you, that you're helping people do that. Yeah, that I is very much what I hope that the book does. I think that that's a really important thing. Um, and yeah, I, I, it makes me very, very glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. Another quote that I love is, uh, this is the quote, if, if we are to comprehend the global climate crisis, it's more essential than ever to be rooted in place. And that's a powerful statement. I 100% agree with you. I think knowing our place, watching it as you do, as Miriam Morrill does over years, getting to know all about it, getting to know it as intimately as you know a relative or a friend is, is super important. And I, I think it's powerful because you've done this over years and I'm sure even more so after investing yourself so deeply in this project you can't be separated from this particular landscape this particular part of the world can you talk a little about this root these roots that you're making by paying sustained compassionate attention to this landscape yeah what it does it, it sort of what i realized just now it's kind of parallel with the 
the sort of the realization on hearing about those newts that foam up in fire and that telling me, whoa, there's all these other things out there that we don't know about because we barely know about this. <laughs> so there's a ton of stuff we don't know about. So really what I have gotten out of, of just starting to know the tiniest bit about this one place is is how much out there that I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah. And and understanding what it would, well, not understanding, but having a, a just the faintest glimpse at what it would really mean to know a place, um, and to know it in the way that one is required to if one is going to truly act in partnership with fire, um, because what I have been you know, so, so impressed and, and, and uh, amazed by is, is understanding how, when people do use fire, when indigenous um, groups use fire here and in Australia, um, and of course, other places as well, the incredibly deep knowledge in knowing where it's yes. going to burn so that once you set that fire, it takes care of itself. It does yeah. what it needs to do and is um, allowed to do that and then stopped when it needs to stop by the conditions, by the vegetation that's growing and where you set that fire. There's a there's a wonderful book that I read recently about Australia that goes into such incredible detail <laughs> um, about what it meant to know when and how to burn and how that meant that the fires would just burn and then would just stop when they'd done what they mm -hmm. needed to do because the plants that were there at that time allowed them to burn where they should and then stop them when they shouldn't. And so I have just the barest um, hint of that in understanding what shrubs grow at Cold Canyon and what the, what they do um, in fire. Um, and so I know that chemise, for example, is a shrub that has um, waxy, chemicals in its leaves that promote fire they're flammable so once a fire starts chemise really helps it burn hot mm -hmm, <laughs> and spread mm -hmm. from from chemise to chemise because chemise loves fire and it's very healthy for it to burn um, but in that same habitat there um, are other shrubs like coyote brush and toyone for example that actually have that act to slow down fire um, coyote brush actually has some fire retardant chemicals in its leaves that help slow down fire so you've got wow. shrubs that have evolved to just all between themselves manage fire so that it burns in a mosaic pattern so that it eventually stops burning um, and so having been able to witness just that tiny bit of it myself and, and hearing about what, what people used to know in order to be able to work with fire so effectively is, is just <laughs> awe-inspiring and, and um, you know, I mean, it, it's wonderful. Again, the most beautiful things are, are getting the glimpses of all the things that we don't know um, and, and what we are missing now by having let go of all of that knowledge because we didn't think that it was important. Yes, and and realizing that that's the way forward. Yeah. Listening, that's right. <laughs> listening to these knowledge keepers, listening to what was known and what needs to be brought forward again, uh, because all of that was excluded and has caused fires to change in terms of frequency and um, intensity. And so, listening to that is super important for for going forward. In both places, That's right. here and, and That's there. Right. Yeah, because it's yeah. the same intimate knowledge. <laughs> yeah. And in terms of that, I just love how, you know, there is this sense of like wanting to know everything or sitting with a landscape and thinking, I wish I could, I have this myself, like I wish I could know all the things that are going on here. But there is actually something really wonderful and exciting that you can spend your entire life in one section of this earth, in one small section, and only know a small portion of the, the story and and get to know it deeply in your lifetime, but right. you don't have you don't have to spread out. To, <laughs> you don't have to know everything in the world. You can spend a lifetime getting to know your patch, your place, your your little piece of ground. Yeah, and that I mean that is that is what is most inspiring to me. Is I I mean I'm, I'm yeah. glad that I can't know it all. If I could know it all, that would be so yeah. disappointing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, amazing. I've so enjoyed talking to you about the book and I can recommend this book to anyone. I'm going to put all the links in the show notes for the podcast for where they can buy it. I I would love to talk about, so you have um, used all sorts of different techniques uh, for capturing this landscape and this story in your nature journal and coming up in the next few weeks is the wild wonder nature journaling conference and you are again going to be a teacher there and you're going to be teaching about shadows capturing shadows and how shadows can tell a story um i'm really excited to take your class i'd love for you to talk a little about the class that's coming up yeah so um sort of extending from the field sketching and capturing an ecosystem, um, I have, it has slowly dawned on me just how important and useful shadows can be in conveying how whatever your primary subject is that you were focusing on, how it fits in with everything around it. Um, I find myself, um, you know, as I'm drawing something, suddenly surprised to see the shadow of what I've drawn and how, where it's cast. And, you know, it's cast on the rock next to it. It's cast underneath it. It's cast down on a leaf right below it and how that interacts with other shadows. And so it has just become more and more important to me as a way to um, to tell a bigger story without, I mean, without having to draw every single thing that I see around me every time. And, yes. you know, being selective about what I capture, shadows are um, such a such a great way of conveying a whole lot of information <laughs> about how things are situated um, and revealing things about the the form of what you're drawing that you didn't realize because of the angle you were drawing it at um, or um, other things bigger things like helping to convey of course the you know the light uh, of the environment uh, you know it, it gives a, a fairly quick way of, of showing that you know this was a really bright sunny day or this was actually a really cloudy overcast day and there were no shadows um, so it, it, it it's just this great way of, of really grounding whatever you're drawing in in the rest of its habitat absolutely i'm so excited to take that class and uh I have been, uh, it's been wonderful to, to chat with you again and to revisit this story and especially to read the book and, and to get more depth into, into how you experience this landscape and the things that you've discovered. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast again. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's such a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Robin. Her book, The Cold Canyon Fire Journals, is an absolute delight. It's full of ecological stories and nature journal pages, and I know you're going to love it. In the show notes, I've put a link to Robin's website where you can find out more. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. Mm-hmm.